we really are trying to encourage um, physicians and providers to have conversations earlier when they may think that somebody may have less than six months to live. And this will allow for them to get the most benefit of their support and allows them to sort of have a conversation about what's important to them and what's meaningful to them um, in those last few weeks, months of their life. Hello, and welcome to 20 Minute Health Talk. I'm your host, Rob Hoyle. From pain and symptom management to education, emotional and spiritual support, hospice care can improve and even extend life for some patients with advanced illness, as well as offer respite for families. Yet this vital resource is severely underutilized in New York State, ranking 50th among all states in proportion to those who receive hospice services prior to death. Today, we speak with two palliative care experts about the factors that lead to low hospice care utilization in New York State and how that compares to the national picture and what families should know. Dr. Tara Lieberman is the executive director for Northwell Health's Hospice Care Network, which takes care of patients from Putnam, Westchester, Staten Island, Queens, Nassau County, and Suffolk County. Dr. Lieberman, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. And we have Dr. Mia Klar, who is an outpatient geriatric and assistant professor in the Department of Medicine at the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra University. Dr. Klar, welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for both being here on the show today. Uh, Dr. Lehman, what is hospice care and how does it benefit patients and those around them? So hospice care is a a benefit for those um, patients and their loved ones when we consider them having less than six months to live. Um, and this is a des- um, something that we've designated by their physician or their um, provider and PPA, et cetera, who may say that we're concerned that this loved one has less than six months to live. And then they are uh, referred to a hospice benefit, which allows for patients and their families to remain in their home and be cared for in totality um, by um, high level physicians, nurses, social workers, chaplains um, to care for them in their home. So now that we've established what hospice is, let's clarify what it's not. Negative public perceptions surrounding hospice care can often delay or prevent patients and their families from the benefits. Dr. Clark, what are the primary misconceptions you hear? Sure. I would say the biggest misconceptions are hospices where people go to die, which means that people associate hospice with weeks, days, you know, very limited amount of time left. When in In all reality, that's kind of the wrong way to be thinking about it. Hospice is supposed to be utilized for much longer than that. And, you know, the bottom line is people are getting referred a little too late. Um, So that's a big barrier, trying to overcome that negative misconception. Many people think that hospice is done at a healthcare facility outside of the home, when in fact most hospice is done in the patient's home with their family. There are places like inpatient hospice if it's needed, but the goal is to keep them at home. And lastly, uh, a misconception is that hospice is only for older adults, but it can be for all ages of people um, if they have the criteria, like a terminal di- a terminal diagnosis. Yes, and we do take care of um, children, unfortunately, um, but they really do benefit from the support that the team gets, especially when parents want to keep their children in their home. Um, we're very, uh, we work very closely with their providers and the family about how to care for a terminally ill child in their home. What about if somebody is on hospice and, and you think it's the right time and everything, and, and then things start going really well and the patient improves, can they get off of hospice? Absolutely. And we do see that often um, because they get such good care in their homes. Sometimes patients actually, what we say, graduate from hospice is they do well. Um, and then they are discharged from hospice, but they're always welcome to come back. If they start to decline again in the future, we are here to support them. And there's no limit in the times that they can come back. And that's really important for people to understand um, because a lot of times people think once they're on there, they can never come off or if they come off, they can't go back on. And that's just a misnomer. Right. So there's no penalty from the insurance company saying, "Eh, you already were on hospice. You can't go back on it. So another misnomer might be that people go into hospice and they get a whole new doctor or care team. And that's not true. Correct. You can still keep your doctor and be on hospice and your specialist too. Um, It's just that you get the added benefit of having the whole hospice team at your, for support as well, including the nurses, the social workers and, and everyone. 
So you don't have to lose your doctor. You don't have to lose your own personal aid. You can keep your your team there. A lot of people think that once placed on hospice that they are going to stop all their medications and just place them on morphine. And that is definitely not the truth. The reality of it is, is we continue to care for the patient appropriately with medications that are needed for their disease um, and support them. If they require some kind of um, medication for symptom management, like an opioid for shortness of breath or pain, we would um, provide that in a reasonable way. Um, but we're, we don't initiate unless it's necessary. So I think that there's really uh, a lot of stigma around hospice and thinking hospice means a morphine drip, and that's completely not the truth. Uh, the other big barrier is the lack of physician kind of knowledge of the specific criteria and then the crystal ball. So it's difficult for physicians to predict someone's life duration. Um, and so those are um, reasons of why patients aren't referred earlier and more patients aren't referred are there things being done to to train primary care physicians to help have that conversation and to help, you know, bring up the subject? Our medical school does an amazing job of having conversations about what a healthcare proxy is, um, who, who can make decisions when they um, are unable to. They do a very good job of having conversations that are open and ended and thinking about um, what's important and what matters most. Our health system is talking about this as well. And we have a lot of initiatives around you know, goals of care conversations and making sure that they're being addressed when somebody has multiple comorbidities or something that an advanced illness. Yep. Talking about advanced care directives earlier on, I think COVID, uh, the pandemic itself really highlighted that need and, and um, really kind of began that conversation, uh, made us aware of that need to have that conversation earlier with patients when, you know, before they're in uh, a crisis. Uh, and I think a lot of people will always say too, you, you have to be your own advocate or advocate for your family. So I guess it's always, even if it's not the right time, it's always okay. There's no, there's no bad question, right? Yeah. I mean, I think it's a really important thing to do with every family member to have a conversation at the, at, even at the young age of saying, you know, who would be important, who would be the person who's important to me to make a decision if I was unable to. Um, I think that's a really important conversation, even when you're younger, um, because you never know what can happen. And you want to make sure that people understand your wishes and what's most matters to you. Right. And I think that, you know, like when we talk about the misconceptions with death and people kind of are afraid of death or they don't want to talk about death, but it's got to give a sense of dignity for these people to be able to be in their homes and be surrounded by their families. Yeah. I, I think that what happens is, is that like Dr. Clark has said, a lot of these patients are referred too late. And so there are a lot of in crisis mode. And so when somebody becomes acutely sick, we find that they're being um, emergently placed in a hospital or in a nursing home where that's really not the um, best support that they can get at the end of their life. Um, so we really are trying to encourage people. Um, physicians and providers to have conversations earlier when they may think that somebody may have less than six months to live. Um, and this will allow for them to get the most benefit of their support um, that, you know, is provided in their home, including nursing care, um, social work, chaplaincy. Um, this really allows people to have their symptoms well managed and allows them to sort of have a conversation about what's important to them and what's meaningful to them um, in those last few weeks, months of their life. In the other scenarios, we find that patients are maybe having procedures or um, labs or tests done that they may never have wanted and may feel that their um, end was very uncomfortable and very distressful for the patient and the family. You know, at the top of the show, we, we, just, we mentioned how it's so underutilized in New York. Why is it so underutilized and how big of a problem is that? Yeah, I feel that there's a lot of um, an ease of having conversations about what um, is meaningful to the person at the end of the life. And so they're not being had. And so they just assume that um, they want to pursue things that may not extend or improve their quality. Um, and so I think there's a lot of barriers. Um, there's not a lot of education to our um, medical professionals about how to have a conversation, about when is appropriate to have a conversation. And I think that these are things that we should focus on more in the New York State area. How do you have that conversation? What, what is a good way to approach that? And how does a family know when to pursue hospice? So I think it's really important to um, 
identify the patient and who is most important to them to have the conversation with. Um, sometimes it may be alone with the patient or maybe some, they want someone to be there with them. Um, and then to allow them the safe space to say, this is um, a time I'd like to have a conversation about what you're experiencing with your disease process. Um, and then we can have an open honest conversation about what's meaningful to you, what matters most to you. And we talk a lot about that in, um, geriatrics and palliative care, but we like to also expand it to our primary care physicians to just sort of always think to them themselves, what matters most to this patient? Yeah. Dr. Clark, how does someone get referred to hospice? So really it could go either way. The primary care doctor can bring up the conversation with the patient and their family, or, um, you know, the patient and the family can inquire about this with their, with their primary care doctor, their oncologist, you know, wh whoever they, whoever that might be. Um, and I think it's, it's never a bad idea to bring it up and start talking about it just to go ahead and get it out on the table. And, um, like we said, because most of the time patients are getting referred too late and we should, we should bring this conversation in sooner. Yeah. And I guess if it's maybe too soon, it doesn't hurt to have the conversation and maybe be prepared down the line. Exactly. So who is getting hospice and, and who is not? Uh, primarily hospice is, uh, provided to patients with cancer. However, that's not um, always the case. There are other illnesses. There's also a uh, criteria for Alzheimer's dementia or any type of dementia for that matter, heart failure, aortic stenosis, uh, renal disease, pulmonary disease. Um, so like I said, there is that barrier, I think, for physicians don't quite know when is that appropriate to make that referral. Um, but I, I would recommend go ahead and make the referral and have hospice, their physicians come in and evaluate as well to see if it would be beneficial. Is this something that would be in covered, uh, covered by insurance? It is. It is a med uh, Medicare benefit. Um, and actually over 90% of our patients are um, on the Medicare benefit. Um, but there's also private insurances um, that have a, a hospice benefit, um, Medicaid as well. Um, so most patients have that insurance benefit. However, it's always important to just check um, because there are some insurances that do not cover hospice, but we are a non-for-profit organization. So we always find a way to make sure that we're caring for our patients who need this, this uh, important service. You just explained that people, you know, insurance will cover this. What are some of the things that people might not realize that are covered by insurance? So it is covered, um, your, the medications that are related to the disease, the patients' medical equipment, a hospital bed, a commode, um, et cetera. There's also the nurse that comes and visits, the social worker that comes and visits, a chaplain, um, volunteers, um, a home attendant who can come and help with some personal care. Um, so there's a lot of extra benefits that I think people are unaware of when they are signing up for hospice. Yeah. And also too, when you're in hospice, your family pays, plays a role if you want them to, right? Tell us a little bit about how family can play a role. Yeah, so most of the time hospice is done in the home with the care of the family. Um, and then on top of that, we have hospice nurses, uh, personal aides that can help, um, and then the whole group of social workers, um, pastoral care, and volunteers. Uh, volunteers. Yeah. Um, and they really do an amazing job of supporting the family in their home. Um, and they will you know, help them find the ways to care for them um, as long as it's feasible to be in their home. Um, sometimes there are patients that have symptoms that can't be managed in their home. Um, um, that's like pain management or wound care, and that can be done in an inpatient unit, um, which is usually a short period of time, but is very helpful in helping patients um, stabilize their symptoms and get them back into their home. Yeah. And we were talking a little bit before about, you know, like the, the underutilization and maybe there's a little taboo when, when death comes and people don't, aren't comfortable having those conversations. What about different cultures? Culturally, is, is it, is it more difficult for some cultures to, to, to bit buy into hospice? I would say that, you know, hospice meets, uh, meets the patient and the family where they're at. Um, so, you know, if there are cultural or, um, religious uh, concerns. We work very closely with them in order to understand what's meaningful to them and what's meaningful to the patient. And we try to meet them where they're at. Um, so we try to engage a diversity of patients and their families. Um, and that's why we have the 
chaplains and that's why we have our social workers so we can understand what's meaningful and what matters to them most. Um, and that's why it's so important to have the conversation earlier, despite the concern of there being a cultural um, aversion to hospice when we don't really know that um, we just assume that and we should really be open and honest about what we think would be really important and meaningful to them. What do you, what do you do um, to, to try and, and, and get people comfortable having that conversation because it can be an awkward conversation for sure. It's definitely, it can be an awkward conversation. We do a lot of education um, through our health system um, and in the community. And also just always knowing that there's a resource for hospice. If they are feeling uncomfortable having that conversation, we're here that we can reach out to the patient and the family to also explain what those benefits are. Um, as long as there's a an initial you know, introduction to the idea, we're here to help and support figuring out what's meaningful to them and see if that's a great fit for them in their home. Can you, do you guys have any stories or you want to just tell us a little bit about like a, an example of how it's really helped not only the patient, but the patient's family? Sure. Uh, I've had multiple examples of this during my, my time uh, treating geriatrics and, and um, end of life care. But I would say, um, you know, there've been many examples where patients have been in the hospital, particularly with dementia um, and who are having you know, acute episodes of delirium where they don't understand what's going on with them in the hospital. And then they, they may end up kind of having adverse medications given to them to, to try to manage some of their symptoms and everything's are just kind of going in the wrong direction. Um, not the family's not wanting them to be there and they really want to bring them home. Um, so hospice is a time where, you know, they've really, uh, been grateful to have the patient come to the house where they could spend time with them patients in their home, they know where they are, they have their normal caregiver who's been with them, then we can add on extra support to them. The family's been there with them. Um, it's a better, it's a calmer environment. There's not beeping buzzers going off. There's not people coming in all throughout the night trying to check your blood pressure, draw in your blood. It's, it's peaceful and we're not doing unnecessary harm and they're not suffering and we're trying to maximize, you know, their symptom control and it's just a a much better um, end of life care that during that transition, I've had that multiple times. I could see it too being so comforting to be for for the loved ones to know that that per, their their loved one is in their home, they're comfortable. I think there's always this fear or of not knowing when somebody does pass in a hospital, were they suffering? What was it like? Was there a million things beeping and going on and all this other stuff? But when you're in the home, there's got to be some sort of comfort and peace for people also in acceptance for their transition. Agreed. I think that we hear this over and over again. If I had only heard earlier, I would have been home. I would have been home earlier. I would have had more time to be with my family. I would have had more time to be able to be with the people that I want to be surrounding me. And in a hospital setting, that's limited. And so that's why being in their home is so much more comforting and acceptance is much more inviting. Um, and so that's why we have so many great stories about families who've just come back so many times and said, we really wish we had known about this service earlier and we would have utilized it more um, readily for my, my family member and others that will unfortunately need this service in the future. We always like to end on a positive note here on 20 Minute Health Talk. So I'll ask both of you and I'll start with you, Dr. Clark. Um, just tell me what gives you hope, what gives you optimism going forward? I would say what gives me hope is knowing that we have this great um, community and this great resources through Northwell, through Hospice Care Network, and, you know, that there's a whole team of physicians and healthcare providers who are there trying to make a difference, trying to help patients and their family members, you know, to the best that we can. That gives me hope. Awesome. Dr. Lieberman, what gives you hope? Um, the hope is that I um, really see a change of how people are looking at hospice and really thinking about um, how they can involve their patients and their um, families earlier. I think that this is a difficult conversation and I see the hope of people wanting to do more so that they get the right care at the right time. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful for this to be um, something that will be more involved in, in their care of their patients on an ongoing basis. And that's um, something that we look forward to in the future. That's awesome. Dr. Lieberman, Dr. Clark, thank you so much for joining us here on 20 Minute Health Talk. And for you, the listener, thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Rob Hoyle. Have a great day and stay safe.
Get more expert insight from the leading voices in healthcare today. You can subscribe to 20 Minute Health Talk wherever podcasts are available.